Recently, Chinese people have been rising up. Around the world, there's been an intense rash of Chinese nationalism targeted towards previously mundane things like N the NBA, handbags, and more. I make Chinese history videos. I get a taste of it from time to time. Luckily, there's always the ban button. But this whole kerfuffle has gotten me thinking about why or how exactly it became this way. So I decided to do some digging into the rise of China's great patriotic keyboard warriors, a generation of young people with a chip on their shoulder about their country's place in the world. It is 1991, and the Chinese Communist Party faced a critical point in its history. The Soviet Union has fallen, and a bad thing happened in Beijing's public square three years earlier. The party's top leadership realized that it needed to pivot it away from the tainted brand of communism. But to what? Deng Xiaoping decided that the party needed to rebrand itself in the eyes of its younger generation. I have told foreign guests that during our last 10 years, our biggest mistake was made in the field of education, primarily in ideological and political education, not just of students, but of the people in general. We did not tell them enough about the need for hard struggle, about what China was like in the old days and what kind of country it was to become. That was a serious error on our part. Thus came about the patriotic education curriculum, a fateful narrative pivot in China's youth. So what is that exactly? It differs depending on the locale, and the summary is a generalization that follows. Historically, the patriotic education takes place during the junior high school level, grades 7 through 9 in America. While the idea first came up in 1991, it would be a few years before the curriculum would be fully completed, the first kids being taught in 1994. For the first few years after the PRC's founding, Chinese kids were taught the historical victor narrative, and it goes something like this. The Chinese nation suffered because of the corruption and incompetence of the Qing dynasty, as well as the nationalist Kuomintang elite classes. But under the leadership of the party, China defeated its enemies, won national independence, and thus glory. Education focused on class struggle and political science, with students studying Marxist doctrines. This makes sense as Mao himself was a communist through and through, a man thoroughly dedicated to revolution and class struggle against the bourgeoisie. The party itself was met at the time was made mostly of working class peasants. It styled itself as the vanguard of the Chinese working class. Mao is dead, but he would be rolling in his preserved glass tomb if he lived to see his party today. The party under Deng and Jiang Zemin is now mostly made up of highly educated, and now quite wealthy, bourgeoisie types with college educations and PhDs. But really something I've learned over time is that most organizations today would horrify their glorified founders from Christianity to the United States Founding Fathers. In its current state, the party can't obviously continue under the theories of class struggle and communism. So it rebranded under the 100 years of Chinese humiliation narrative. In this new nationalist narrative, China was turned from a victor into a victim. Historical textbooks and narratives were re-engineered. China no longer focused on the struggles of the worker classes against the elite classes. Now it was about the foreigners the others outside the country, invading China, plundering its treasures, and raping its people. Here is one example. The anti-Japanese war in the 1940s had been seen as being an internal class conflict between the CCP and the Guomindan. The Guomindan were corrupt and impotent, while the CCP valiantly fought almost single-handedly against the Japanese. A few textbooks even purported that the war was fought solely by Communist Party troops. Entirely untrue. The new historical narrative repositions the war as an international conflict between the Chinese and Japanese ethnic nations. The Guomindan are allowed to receive ample credit for their sacrifice, as the emphasis is now on the humiliation and trauma of the Japanese invasion of the Chinese motherland. This in general is the thrust of the new 100 years narrative. The 100 years of humiliation at the hands of foreign Western invaders like the French, British, and the Japanese. For many Chinese people, Learning about the details of invaders' atrocities, the unequal treaties, and the military defeats of the 100 years has been more than effective. The reason for setting up this narrative is to rebrand the Communist Party as no longer a Communist Party, practicing class struggle between the rich and the poor. The message instead is simple. Today's Communist Party of China is a nationalist patriot struggling to protect the independence and sovereignty of the nation. I will quote the words of former Paramount leader Jiang Zemin in a 1996 speech. Our party has inherited and carried forward the Chinese nation's outstanding tradition, and has made the biggest sacrifice 
and the biggest contribution in the struggle of national independence and safeguarding of national sovereignty. We have therefore won the heartfelt love and support from people of all nationalities in China. The Chinese Communist is the firmest, most thoroughgoing patriot. The Communist Party of today is a Chinese patriot in the purest sense. It has driven out the foreign invaders of yore, it has destroyed the unequal treaties imposed on it by the West, it has created a powerful national army, and reasserted itself as the great China on the world stage. If you're not for the party, you are not for China. End statement. So why does it seem like Chinese nationalists are always so sensitive to slights today? It's mostly because, in my opinion, the default mental narrative is to assume themselves as a victim of the various outside forces. We are living in the Chinese patriotic education generation, with the first products of the 1991 education reform beginning to show itself in its current behavior in Chinese people abroad in Ch and as well as in China. It has been drilled into them from youth, and it is the first way of thinking even as they get exposed to different narratives later in life. On a personal note, I think the toughest part of dealing with this sort of attitude is that people always just see it in this single way, unaware that it is not the actual reality, it's just a historical narrative imposed on them by someone else. They see every event in China's past, present, and future through the extremely defensive lens, and it's hard to deal with people like that. It's just exhausting. But for the most part, it seems that the party is satisfied with the results. The victim mentality brainwashing has been found to be much more effective than boring Marxist political theory in cultivating loyalty amongst party members. Today, students are no longer willing or able to criticize the party for fear of being seen as unpatriotic. The narrative is thus being rolled out to other aspects of Chinese culture and media. But nationalism is a double-edged sword in more ways than one. First, the party now finds itself having to actively cater to its loud, angry nationalists and assuage their anger before it burns out of control and interferes with their policy goals. Times when the party could make a deal with external parties, like the one regarding the North Korean border that I mentioned in my last video, are no longer possible, as the party now needs a signal to its domestic audience that it is sufficiently patriotic. Secondly, things never happen in a single system by themselves, and nationalism in one country triggers nationalism in another. In my next article, I will talk about Taiwan's version of patriotic education, instituted after China's, and the new generation that exists because of it. Thanks.